Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussion, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examination. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Monday, we're asking the question, is Jesus worshipped in the New Testament? This is um, a video that we're doing because there was recently a video put out uh, where a Muslim was, of course, pushing back on this issue. And so we're going to review that video. And to do that, joining me is Louis Dizon. Louis, welcome back. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well, you know, uh, I'm very excited to do this. I've uh, been uh, refreshing uh, on some of my Greek in preparation for this because uh, okay. there's actually a lot of Greek involved in this um, discussion. Um, and, and that's necessary considering who we're reviewing, which is Ijaz Ahmed. Um, actually, I think in order to set this up, I should say a little bit something about Ijaz. He's actually someone that I've known for a long time. Our um, initial um, discussions on Christianity and Islam go all the way back to 2010. And actually, it's a little bit of a rough start there, but uh, we've gotten to know each other well. Uh, I actually consider him a friend. Uh, he moved here to Toronto. So some once in a while, I actually uh, see him in person. and. Uh, I've actually debated him a couple of times, and I once went on like a Dawa channel where he's a regular. Mm. Um, so he's someone that I I have had a fair bit of interaction with, and um, you know he is uh, a cut above some of the other uh, Muslim apologists that we've seen on this channel to date, like Zakir Naik and mm -hmm. um, Yusuf Evans. Like compared to them, Ejaz actually puts out some uh, relatively tougher arguments, and you actually do need to do a bit of homework to properly rebut them. Uh, he's not someone that um, ought to be taken lightly when it comes to these discussions. So w one thing that caught my attention recently is the video that we are um, discussing right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it seems to be an extract of a much longer conversation or debate between him and uh, a Christian by the name of Bradley. Now, I don't know a whole lot about this Bradley fellow. Uh, mm -hmm. I looked at uh, his um, Twitter page. Uh, it says here he's a Reformed Presbyterian and uh, he just turned 18 years old yesterday. So uh, if Bradley's listening, happy birthday, guy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for a young fellow like that to be involved in theological debates yeah. at the <laughs> age, you know, uh, especially when you're facing off a formidable opponent, you know, that's not something to, you know, sneeze at, I'd say. Um, but I don't know a whole lot about uh, this fellow. I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about uh, Bradley's responses to Ijaz. I'm going to, I want to focus a little bit more on some of the things that Ijaz has said uh, as arguments against um, uh, the Christian belief that um, Jesus is to be worshipped as divine. So... Uh, if we could pull up the uh, mm -hmm. video now. Yeah. 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 All right. Let me right. share my screen here. And please let me know if there's any trouble with the audio. Yeah. Okay. We'll All right. You should see it now. Okay. So before we play it, I just want to make a comment on something. Um, <laughs> notice that... Um, the video here says only quote from the four gospels. And if you look, they tend to focus on the four gospels. Now, um, there's a little bit of, um, you know, this is sort of like an artificial limitation that Muslims like to put on Christians whenever we're discussing the divinity of Jesus. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you can only quote from the four gospels. The other uh, books of the New Testament, they're off bounds. Some, uh, um, Muslims will go even further and say, you can only quote the red letters in the Gospels. So the black letters are also off balance because that's not Jesus's words. Those are just commentary by the Gospel authors. Now, whenever uh, you encounter uh, such a limitation being placed uh, mm -hmm. by a Muslim in discussions, I think it'd be fair to ask, why should we abide by such a limitation? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, from a Christian perspective, we regard all 
of scripture as divinely inspired <clears throat> uh, the right. red letters in the gospels are not more authoritative than the rest of the new testament and not only that um like there there are elements like when if you go to the pauline epistles for example uh, a mm -hmm. lot of it actually does represent teaching that is even earlier than what's contained in the gospels uh, a great example of this if we're sticking to the context of the divinity of jesus would be the um hymn to christ as god in philippians chapter 2 um verses 5 to 11. now a lot of commentators have actually noted that this is a pre-pauline hymn that he's not making this composition up that it was around before him and um actually larry hurtado um who wrote on the christology of the new testament notes that uh, saint paul is appealing to pre-existing um uh, christian creedal formulations that affirm jesus divinity so even saint paul didn't make all this up uh, so uh with that uh out of the way i think that um it would be even we're going to focus mostly on the gospels but we're going to look at a couple of texts outside of the gospels as well that are relevant to this discussion uh and i believe that it would be fair game to do so all right so and start with the first uh clip mm -hmm. okay let's go ahead and start it's fall i'll pause there okay so this is pretty easy to respond to i already gave you the argument notice you never addressed it you did United, mm -hmm. you said that the true O is not exclusively used for the Father. So you made a positive claim here. Mm. I could not find mm -hmm. a single reference. I looked myself and I checked Dr. Dim, James D.G. Dunn's book, Did the First Christians Worship Jesus? I found no reference from him either. And I used BibleHub.com to check for the references as well, freely available for anyone, exclusively in the New Testament in the gospels in particular, used for Christ, sorry, used for the Father only, not once for Christ. You're making the claim that that's an incorrect claim. Please demonstrate to us one place within the four gospels where the term La Truo is positively used for Christ Jesus and not the Father. Remember, you denied my claim, which means you have some kind of evidence in front of you, which proves that point. But notice, guys, that he never responded to the claim of the four Gospels. How is it possible that the authors of the four Gospels altogether used a particular term of worship for God the Father that they refused, let's be clear, even once to use for God the Spirit or God the Son? And I think that was the end of the first clip, correct? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, I think uh, we've got a good um, foundation on which we can build some of our commentary on the arguments that are being presented. So now, um, if we can um, possibly switch uh, to... Also, I'm hearing a bit of echo on my end. Um, um, yeah, see if maybe the speakers could be turned down a little bit. Yeah, okay, let me try this. Um, okay, uh, hopefully this will be better. Um, so anywho, um, I just want to address some of the words that are used, uh, the, because there's some Greek being, um, tossed around like Latruo or Latrefo, if you want to use the, um, proper Koine Greek pronunciation. Uh, so one of the, so the major argument, and I've heard Ijaz use this more than once, this isn't the first time he made it, is that there is a specific word for worship of divinity it's latrefo um or you know again if you want to use that cringy erasmian pronunciation they always use in seminaries latruo um his argument is that it's never used of jesus in the gospels uh like when you see the word worship and it's attributed to jesus in the gospels there's a different word being used it's proskineo mm -hmm. and that's like it has a different uh, shade of meaning in Latruo. Uh, his argument is because Latruo or Latrefo is never used of Jesus anywhere in the Gospels, that means that Jesus is never actually worshipped as God there. Um, notice the, the limitation that I already mentioned, that you're only supposed to look in the four Gospels for this. This is important. Uh, I'm going to uh, mention why that's important shortly. But first, I want to make note of the fact that... Um, Ijaz is um, engaging in a classic 
um, exegetical mistake when doing um, Greek word studies, which is to assume that uh, specific um, connotations or like meanings are bound up to specific words. So if one word is used and not another, that means that um, th that a certain concept is not present. Now, mm. uh, to be fair to Ejaz, this is not uh, this is actually a fairly common mistake um, mm -hmm. that a lot of elementary or even intermediate uh, Greek students make. Um, I remember uh, similar exegetical uh, fallacies being proclaimed from the pulpit um, in a lot of evangelical churches back when I was a Protestant. Um, so, you know, it's very easy to fall into. The corrective mm -hmm that would be to understand um, the discipline of lexical semantics. So you can see on my screen, I have a book up. It's called Biblical Words and Their Meeting, An Introduction to Lexical Semantics by Moises Silva. Uh, this is considered one of the um, best introductions to the field of lexical semantics. And he talks about the very thing that um, you were talking about, how people tend to um, you know, a lot of exegetes make this mistake that um, uh, you tend to attach uh, specific um, concepts to specific words. Um, and, you know, he's work building off of the work of an earlier biblical linguist, uh, William Barr, from the semantics of biblical language. Um, the main uh, problem that we are dealing with here is that um, in when you're talking about biblical languages, uh, and this applies to both Hebrew and Greek. There's a, a concept called the lex, the semantic domain or the semantic range, mm -hmm. uh, which basically means what are all the possible shades of meaning that a word can have in all the various contexts that it occurs. Because the same word can be used um, in more than one context uh, and with different shades of meaning, you know. And this is true of every language. Just think of in English. I use the word shoot. What if I told you, I'm going to shoot you, you know? That doesn't sound very friendly until I pull out my camera. And then you realize that when I said, I'm going to shoot you, I'm using shoot in the sense of, I'm going to take a photograph of you. Mm -hmm. um, now, with regards to semantic ranges, uh, actually, uh, one there's a, an appendix to this book called... Um, Distinguishing the Meaning of Greek Verbs in the Semantic Domain for Worship. And this was written by um, written by Karen Jobes. Um, so, you know, so Silva didn't write the appendix, but uh, Jobes did. And one of the things she notes is the fact that there are actually multiple words in Greek that are translated as worship in our English translations. All right. And she lists them here. They are proskineo, efseveo, latrefo, sevome, and sevazome. Um, and all of these words, um, they overlap to an extent in their meaning, but they all have slightly different semantic ranges. Um, so each of them connotes something slightly different, even if they're translated the same way. Mm -hmm. And if I scroll further down, actually uh, she talks about what are the different uh, shades of meaning of this so uh, Job's um, states within the irregularly shaped constellation formed by the New Testament words for worship three clusters of sense emerge worship as serving a deity by performing cultic acts in a religious vocation the trefo the torreo and possibly sevazome worship as submitting to divine authority Proskineo, Campto, Toini, and worship as the exercise of personal piety. Efseveo, Sevome, and probably Sevazome. So some of these words uh, fall into one more, to more than one category. She further writes, and I quote, the three clusters of meaning are improperly synonymous. That is, all three clusters share a sense that can appropriately be used to refer to the worship of divinity. But each cluster has a distinctive sense that dictates its choice in certain contexts where words of another cluster would be inappropriate. When used in its sense of submission to divine authority, proskuneo is the most general and inclusive verb in the semantic domain for worship. So uh, when we look at the Gospels, 
and you see that uh, in the English translation, it says Jesus, re Jesus receives worship. Um, in the Gospels, generally, uh, the Greek word that stands behind that is the word proskuneo. And this is significant because uh, proskuneo does have a very wide semantic range. Um, in some older um, like theological lexicons and word books, it used to be that uh, it was said that proskuneo in the New Testament always refers to worship. So I have here the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament by um, Bromley and Kittle. Um, and, it, and, and this actually makes the argument that proskunein um, is always um, has a divine object. And then uh, the TDNT goes on to argue that even the apparent exceptions to the rule are not real exceptions. Now, um, you know, Silva and other points to lexical semantics are somewhat um, critical of the methodology used in TDNT. But they still recognize that uh, many of its discussions have value. So, you know, we can take this with a grain of salt, but we don't uh, necessarily throw it out altogether. Um, so when you look at proskineo, um, the word for worship in the Gospels, actually, it has multiple um, possible connotations. And here, um, Job's actually um, talks about them. So let me see. Where is the, where the discussion begin? Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, here. Uh, pro, it says here, proskuneo is the most frequently used word for worship in the New Testament and also appears to have the largest semantic range. In fact, Worship of deity is only one of three senses of this verb. In addition to its sense of worship, proskuneo is found in reference to paying political homage, and in the third sense is used to refer to entreaty, often accompanied by the posture of kneeling or prostration. So it says here that if you see proskuneo in the New Testament, it has at least one of these three different um, connotations. And we'll see that when we look at some of the examples of it, okay? Uh, if you're reading the New Testament in order, the very first place where the word occurs is actually in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. Um, it's the three wise men saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star and it rose and we have come to worship him. And here it says, proskinise auto. Um, now, the question is, does this refer to to divine worship, or is it more of like a political sense of homage? And this is where the commentators tend to disagree with one another. So, you know, on the one hand, um, Job's does not think so. Um, she actually has a discussion of this. It says here, when proskuneo is used in Matthew 2 to describe the intent and actions of the delegation of Magi at the birth of Jesus, it is, I believe, this sense of political homage that Matthew intended. As delegates of an Eastern monarch, the Magi came seeking the newborn human king of the Jewish nation in order to pay political homage. Recognizing him as royalty, they genuflected before the Christ child as they presented their gifts. So according to her, um, worship in Matthew chapter 2 is not being used in the sense of worship of divinity. More It's used being more in the sense of political um, homage. Now, her, her opinion is just one of multiple opinions on this topic. Uh, we can mention the fact that Kittle uh, actually thinks uh, otherwise. So uh, Kittle actually in the TDNT states, the proskinesis of the wise men uh, is truly offered to the ruler of the world. So from his view, this is actually divine worship. Um, but less people think that the TDNT is uh, outdated. Uh, there's another uh, source that we can use, uh, and that is Loanida's Greek lexicon uh, of the New Testament based on semantic domains. So Loanida actually do take lexical semantics into consideration, and um, they are aware of the different possible shades of meaning that a word can have, uh, and they take that into account. So every time, so when a word has more than one shade of meaning, they would actually have more than one entry for that word. Um, to reflect those different shades. Now, what do they have to say about uh, Matthew 2, verse 2? In Loanida, it says, 
to express by attitude and possibly by position one's allegiance to and regard for deity, to prostrate oneself in worship, to bow down in worship. So from Loanita's perspective, which disagrees with Job's and agrees with Kittle's, uh, Matthew chapter 2 is actually describing divine worship. But, you know, uh, we shouldn't um, content ourselves with these apparent um, ambiguous um, examples. Um, Matthew 2 is admittedly an ambiguous case. You could understand it as divine worship, or you could understand it as, um, you know, uh, political uh, reverence. But there are some places where you cannot possibly understand proskineo um, in the sense of merely uh, giving political homage or even of making an entreaty. Uh, let me show you a few examples. Um, Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, sorry, 33 rather. And those in the boat worship him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. So here, the word worship, prosekinisan. Um, so keep in mind what um, we just read, that there are three possible uh, connotations of proskineo. Um, so let's look at the two alternatives. Is this political homage? Now, clearly not, because uh, if you read the context of Matthew 14, it's not a political context. Jesus had just calmed the waters. Uh, he had performed a great miracle. Now, it's not uh, entreaty because the disciples are not asking Jesus to do anything. He had already done uh, what he had set out to do. So this is in response to what Jesus had done. So in Matthew 14, 33, uh, if we rule out the alternative possible understandings of proskineo, uh, we would um, conclude that the only possible meaning of the word in Matthew 14 is actually uh, divine worship. Now, let's look at some other examples. Um, Matthew 28, 17, this is right after uh, the um, resurrection of Jesus. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So again, let's look at the possible ranges of meaning. This is clearly not a political context, nor are the disciples asking Jesus for anything. So that leaves us with only one possible um, connotation. They are giving divine worship to Jesus here. So we can see, even if you grant that proskineo doesn't always mean divine worship in every instance uh, that occurs. You can reasonably infer from some of the instances where it does occur in the Gospels in reference to Jesus that the only possible way to understand it is that it's referring to divine worship. Now, let's look at the other word that um, we are uh, concerned with, which is the word latrepo. Um, actually, um, Job's has some discussion of this word um, in her appendix. She writes, La trefo and le toreo share a very specific sense that distinguishes them from the other Greek verbs for worship that have a wider semantic range. In the New Testament, la trefo is used to designate duties performed in a religious vocation. Uh, forms of la trefo are used in the New Testament, for instance, to refer to the temple service of Anna and the altar work of the New Testament, Old Testament priests. As used in the New Testament, the word latrefo denotes actions that are always evaluated positively where, when God is the grammatical object and negatively with reference to any other object. Um, now, one thing I want to note here, um, when we're talking about the possible shades of meaning that a word can have, we do not limit ourselves to just the New Testament. Uh, when we're trying to figure out the meaning of a word, we tend to think of um, word, the meaning of words in uh, some concentric circles. What I mean is, first you look at the word as it occurs in the immediate context that you're examining it in. And then after that, uh, you look at uh, other writings by the same author. So if you're, for example, looking at uh, Latrepo as it occurs in one of St. Paul's epistles, um, you first look at the immediate uh, example you're looking at, and then you look at other examples in Saint Paul, the rest of St. Paul's epistles. And then from there, you widen out to looking at 
every instance in the New Testament. And then from there, you widen even further and you look at every instance of Latrefo uh, that occurs throughout classical Greek literature, which includes the New Testament, but also includes the Septuagint and it includes some of the early church fathers. Uh, and it also includes um, uh, classical Greek literature that precedes the New Testament. Uh, one of the best ways to know all the different shades of meaning that a word takes on in classical literature is using Little and Scott's Greek English lexicon. It's a little bit of an older resource. Um, it's gone through multiple editions throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, but it's still considered the classic as far as classical Greek goes. Um, and it tries to be as wide as possible. Um, it deals with Greek going from uh, early lyric poetry, that is the 7th century BC, all the way up to uh, the New Testament and even some of the Apostolic Fathers. Um, so it's a very useful uh, resource to have if you want to know how certain words are used uh, outside of the New Testament as well. Uh, Besides that, another resource that um, every Greek uh, student ought to have is Bauer, Donker, Art, and Gingrich's Greek English Lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature. Or as um, Greek students who always love to uh, affectionately call it, the BDAG. Uh, the BDAG actually does not limit itself to the New Testament. It covers the early church fathers as well. And to a lesser extent, um, classical Greek literature. So this is considered the gold standard if you want to do like Greek exegesis. Um, unfortunately, I don't have it on Logos, but I do have a physical copy, as you can see. Um, now, with Latrefo, all of the instances, instances that we have found in the New Testament are actually um, religious in nature. Um, like it's cultic or liturgical worship in view. But actually, what's interesting that I found is that if you look at Latrefo as used outside of the New Testament, is that sometimes it actually uh, has secular connotations. There is a secular uh, use of Latrefo um, or Latria, uh, if you want to use the noun form. So actually, um, in some classical Greek literature, Latrefo is used to mean to work for hire or pay, to be in servitude or serve. Um, can mean to be subject or enslaved to, uh, to be devoted to. And then, of course, there's the religious connotation, to serve the gods with prayer and sacrifices. And why this is important is because I want to um, clarify a misconception, which is that whereas proskuneo sometimes means divine worship and not always, latrefo always means divine worship, as you can see, that's not true. There is actually a secular use of latrepo, where the word is used in contexts that have nothing to do with religion or worship. Um, and, and this is why um, simply looking for instances of latrepo in reference to Jesus is not uh, sufficient, because even if we did have some instances, somebody who is really determined to deny that Jesus is divine could say, well, you know, yeah, Jesus may be re receiving latria, uh, but uh, it's not in a religious context necessarily. Uh, so you have to watch out for that. Now, you know, let's answer the question that has been posed. Uh, why is it that Latrefo or Latreia, um, the uh, noun form, is never used of Jesus in the Gospels? And there's a simple answer to that. Um, if you consider the connotation of Latrefo, it's closely connected to Liturgeo, which is actually where we get the word liturgy from. And that clues you in. Latruo or Latrefo actually denotes cultic or liturgical worship. Um, all the examples that are listed here um, have to do with worship in the context of the temple or the tabernacle. Um, and, you know, uh, that And it sh shows you immediately why Latrefo is not using Jesus in the Gospels, because there is no cultic worship of Jesus in uh, the Gospels. The disciples aren't going into the synagogues or the temple to worship Jesus. Uh, the proper area 
the proper um, locus of cultic worship of Jesus is the church. But as any Christian knows, the church was not established until uh, Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So to speak of Latria directed towards Jesus prior to the foundation of the cult itself, where it could take place, is pretty much meaningless. Um, so we should not expect to find Latrevo um, used of Jesus in the Gospels. Um, now, this is why I said we should not limit ourselves to um, the New Testament to the Gospels. Once we go to the rest of the New Testament literature, we'll see that actually Latrefo is used of Jesus. Um, and there are a couple of places where this is the case. Um, so the first place that I want to look at uh, is Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. All right. So in the ESV, it reads the following. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Um, there, I've, I've surveyed a number of translations of um, of this uh, verse, and there's base, they, there's basically one of two variations of how this is translated. The first variation is what you see in the ESV: worship by the Spirit of God. Um, and then glory in Christ Jesus. The other way of translating this is in the King James Version um, and some of its successors, like the NKJV, where it says, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So notice, worship God in the spirit versus worship by the spirit of God. Which one is correct? Um, actually, the KJV rendering of this verse is incorrect because it turns God into the object of the verb latrefontes, you can see here. However, um, the verb latrefo actually demands that its object be in the dative case. And uh, we'll see if there's a couple of examples that I could point to. Um, if you go to the book of Acts, this particular verb comes up quite a few times. Um, let me see. Uh, John... Acts chapter 7, verse 7, for example. But I will judge the nation that uh, that they serve, said God, and after they shall come out and worship me in this place. La trepsusin mi. So notice that mi uh, is in the dative case. This is a dative form of ego. Um, another example, Acts chapter 7, verse 42. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven. La trefen ti stratia tu ulano. Stratia, once again, here is um, in the dative case. And then one more example, just to drive the point home. You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god Refan, the images that you made to worship. Tus us episete proskunen avtis. Okay, avtis is the dative plural form of avtos. So this should suffice to show you that um, the object of Latrefo has to be in the dative case. Okay. Now let's look again at Philippians chapter three, verse three. Theu is in the genitive case. The fact that it's in the genitive case means that theu is not the object of the verb here. Now the question is, what is the object of the verb? Now. Um, Notice, of course, nefmati is in the um, dative case as well, but it's placed before la trefontes, uh, and there's a reason for that. Um, if we actually translated the word, the verse entirely uh, literally, i.e., you know, with complete, you know, taking into consideration the word order, it would look a little something like this. For we are the circumcision who, in the Spirit of God, worship and boast in Christ Jesus and do not, in the flesh, uh, have confidence. Notice that when I, um, when I render the verse word for word uh, and follow the order of the Greek, uh, that it actually sounds like the, the object of La Trevontes is Christo Jesu. Okay, now here's a question. 
What is the uh, case of Christo Yesu? It is dative. Well, what do you know? So that so the Christo Yesu is actually just the right case for it to be the object of La Trefontes. Now the uh, you know somebody who object to this would say, well, um, Christo Yesu is not functioning as the object of uh, La Trefontes. It's actually functioning as the object of Kavchomeni N, right? Which is fair, you know, Kavchomeni, Kavchaome, uh, to boast, uh, actually also requires uh, that its object be in the dative case. However, I want you to note the parallelism uh, of the two, okay? La Trevontes ke Kavchomeni. It's not immediately obvious until you've actually uh, parsed it, but these are actually almost the same. Um, this is a present active participle, plural, nominative, masculine. You can see the bottom left. Um, and then kavhomini is very similar. It's present middle or passive participle, plural, nominative, masculine. So they're both um, present participles. They're both plural, nominative, masculine. Um, so there's a parallelism here. Uh, whenever you see like, okay, I, I haven't done like a complete study of every time two participles are joined with K here. However, fair to say that vast, at least majority of instances when this type of construction occurs, um, the two uh, verbs that are in view are meant to go together. Um, and a great example of this actually would be in Matthew chapter 11. Um, when Jesus talks about um, here in verse 19, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. Okay, il theos tu anthropu estion ke pinon. Both of these are present active participles, uh, and they are connected together by ke. And notice, eating and drinking, uh, they are um, they're obviously distinct actions, but they're part of uh, the same larger action, which is basically that you know, having table fellowship um, or, you know, having dinner with tax collectors and sinners. Uh, so the way it's constructed means we can't really separate um, the two verbs together. Same thing with worshiping and glorying. They are both actions that take place in the context of the liturgy. Uh, and in both, and the object of both is Christo Yesu. But, you know, if somebody thinks, uh, I don't know if I accept that one. I have one other example to throw at you. Revelation chapter 22, verse 3. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Okay? Now, Okay? A truo is used here. And, you know, what is avto referring back to? If you look at the context... The only possible antecedent of this pronoun is the lamb right here. So it's saying here that in the New Jerusalem, Revelation chapter 22, the servants of the lamb will be rendering latria to the lamb. So you can see here that there are at least two places that I just showed you where uh, the verb latrefo is definitely being used to refer to Jesus. It's just not being used in um, just not being used in the four Gospels which, because we shouldn't expect to see that verb in the Gospels. Whew. A lot to take in there. Um, all right, so the next clip is going to be uh, actually just from where we left off until about 8 minutes and 14 seconds. So let's go ahead and continue. And interestingly, when it says, honor the son as you honor the father, what's confusing here is that Mark chapter 8, verse 38b in the earliest gospel teaches us directly that the glory, the doxy of the father is the same as the angels given to Christ Jesus. And this is according to who? Dr. Philip Comfort in his book, I think, New Testament text and translation commentary. He specifies that. And he refers to it, to my knowledge, as a theological difficulty for at least Christians like Bradley. Not a difficulty for us. We see the change of the de deification of Christ himself. 
So guys, notice he never addressed that point whatsoever. And you'll all... All right, I think that's the end of that clip, if I uh, all right. got that correct. Yeah. So there's a few things here. Um, actually, we're going to get into some um, textual criticism now. Um, Ijaz loves his textual criticism. And, you know, uh, I love when he gets into it because it gives me a chance to um, do some uh, study of my own. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, we're both very interested in this topic and I'm always appreciative of uh, when he cites these scholars, gives, you know, gives me something to look into myself. He cites Philip Comfort here. And uh, for those who don't know, Philip Comfort is a, a well-respected uh, scholar of New Testament textual criticism. He was actually involved in the SBL, Greek New Testament. And he has, um, uh, he actually edited a series of um, um, texts on the earliest Greek New Testament manuscripts, as you can see here. Um, so he is somebody whose opinion is, you know, very weighty, uh, worth taking into consideration. Now, the discussion revolves around Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Um, where it says in the NA 28, patros metaton angelon tonarion. So when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. Um, the textual variant is concerning the word meta. So you can see with the holy angels. Because the way it's worded in here uh, would indicate that the son of man has the same glory as the father. However... Uh, one of the interesting phenomena uh, that occurs here is that if you look at P45, which is the earliest um, extant manuscript of uh, the of Mark chapters 8 and 9, it actually has a variant here. Instead of metaton angelon ton agion, it says keton angelon ton agion. So um, if you translate it, it would be uh, the son of man... Uh, will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father and the holy angels. Now, that one word difference does actually change the meaning a little bit because it implies that the angels have the same class of glory uh, as the father and the son. And if that's the case, then the fact that um, they share in that glory cannot be used as evidence of the deity of Jesus. Now, you know, Philip Comfort um, because of his um, expertise in the subject, is someone uh, not to be taken lightly. And his opinion definitely needs to be considered. Um, and of course, there is a strong basis for it, which is the fact that uh, P45 uh, reads K instead of Meta. However, you know, his opinion is just one of many opinions on this topic. Um, Certainly, if you look at all the various critical editions of the Greek New Testament, none of them have followed Comfort's uh, advice or a suggestion of using the word being K as opposed to meta. So it's not just the NA28. If you look at um, the SBL Greek New Testament as well as the Cambridge Greek New Testament, they also read meta rather than K. So they don't think that this is the correct reading even though it is the earliest. Furthermore, um, the another person uh, who has weighed in on this topic is the late um, Bruce Metzger in his textual commentary on the Greek New Testament. So it, he actually has a section on this very variant that we are discussing. And first of all, for those who are unfamiliar, um, in the... United Bible Society's Greek New Testament, all the readings have a grading of A, B, C, or D. Um, a being most certain, D being least certain. As you can see, the UBS reading uh, meta is actually graded A, which means the editors uh, believe that this it is almost certain that this is the correct reading. Um, and in fact, Metzger states, and I quote, the reading with K instead of meta appears to have arisen from scribal inattentiveness or from assimilation to the parallel in Luke 9, 26. So Metzger doesn't think that comfort is correct, right? And then if you look at uh, the uh, apparatus for this particular verse, 
can see that there are a fairly small number of witnesses that read K. So P45 is the earliest and therefore the weightiest. There's also Codex um, Washingtonianus, and there's um, 2542. I don't know a whole lot about that. And then uh, there's a little, it says here that all of the Syriac versions as well, which I don't think is entirely correct because I look at the Peshitta, um, and it actually has the word am, which in Syriac means with. So this is not entirely true. Some Syriac texts do, in fact, read the same as the NA28. Now, all that being said, let's grant, for the sake of argument, that K is the correct reading. You know, let's say P45 is the original. All those later manuscripts that read meta, they're just a scribal error. Well, okay, I'll grant that. But I've never really thought of Mark 838 as the main text that I would go to if I wanted to show uh, the deity of Christ from the Gospels. There are other texts uh, that have a more solid textual basis than this verse, uh, and I would appeal to those instead. All right. So the next clip is going to come from... Um, 8.38 ish to around 11.15 and it's going to be on what does honor mean. So let me share my screen again. Okay, you should be able to see it. Also notice that Jesus demands what? Honor as they would honor the Father, he does not demand worship la truo as they la truo as they worship the Father. Brother <clears throat> Nadim, is it not the case that... Not sure what's okay. going on. He just said that the prophet spoken about in Isaiah, the one of the voice in the wilderness, that this okay. is... Okay, uh, I think there's a different... That's a, that is going to another topic, um, which you know I have a separate discussion of. Um, I wanted to address this. So, um, actually, it's not stated specifically, but the word for honor occurs in John chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, Okay. Uh, and it's worth looking at this verse. Um, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So, you know, at first glance, looks like a pretty clear, like, hole in one for the deity of Christ, because it says here that the Son receives the same honor as the Father. But, hold on, says our Muslim interlocutor. Uh, it does not say worship here. It says honor, right? Uh, the verb being used here is timao, to honor. Now, as we have already established in our discussions of Greek, um, there is no one word uh, in Greek that means worship 100% of the time. Even latrepo, which has the narrowest semantic range of all of the worship words, does not mean worship all of the time. Uh, in fact, uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but I've actually sp I actually found one place in um, the Greek New Testament where it doesn't mean worship. Okay, uh, in Hebrews ten, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. Tiskini uh, latrefontes. So obviously, it's not saying they're worshiping the tent; rather, they're serving at the tent. So. Um, you can see that even within the New Testament, latrefo is in one place being used uh, in such a way that the object is not necessarily being worshipped. Um, so going back to John chapter 5, the word honor doesn't necessarily mean worship. But is it the case that honor and worship are never the same? Well, uh, I think to answer that, you should look at... Um, Little and Scott, uh, because they have an interesting um, entry for this word. Uh, actually, I'm going to take a shortcut here. Um, I'm going to yeah, I'm going to click on uh, this. So you now this little fancy info panel on the left hand side gives me the entry in Little and Scott. Um, 
also I need to reopen that tab I accidentally closed. Um, Cause that'll come up, that'll be important later. Um, now in the section on Timao, actually, it notes the fact that um, that some in some contexts, the word is used in the sense of honor given to deities. For example, in uh, Sophocles, uh, you have the phrase theus timontes, um, you know, which literally means like the honoring of gods. Um, similarly, in Xenophon, you have seveste ke um, ti, and then timao uh, tus theus. I don't know. Actually, I don't remember what the infinitive form of that would be, but it will be infinitive here. Again, it's uh, in reference to deity is here. So at least we can establish in some of the time um, it is being used to refer to gods. Also here, um, thei de otantimosin within de philon. Okay. But what, but can it, does it mean worship in the proper sense? Um, to answer that, let's look at the noun form of this, which is timi. Um, sometimes you have to look not just at the ver entry for the verb form, but also the noun form as well. The verbal, the noun form is timi. And actually here it notes, that means worship, esteem, honor, and plural honors, such as are accorded to gods or to superiors or to bestowed, whether by gods or men, as a reward for services. So according to Little and Scott, the word for honor in Greek, in at least some contexts, refers to worship. Now here's the million dollar question. Does it refer to worship in John chapter 5, verses 22 to 23? To answer that, I want to make note of one important little word, which is the word kathos, all right? In a pantes, timosin ton ion, kathos timosin ton patera. Kathos in Greek is a, what you call a marker of similarity, as um, Go and Nita would put it. Um, and what that means is that um, the type of honor that is given to the son is the same type of honor that is given to the father. Well, what kind of honor, honor do we give to the Father? Well, obviously, that would be worship, you know. So this is just reasoning by inference. If the honor that we give to the Father is worship and the Son receives the same type of honor as the Father, then it follows that the type of honor given to the Son is also worship. So it's fairly simple syllogistic reasoning. Uh, should not be too hard to follow. Um, All right. You want me to continue with the rest of the video? Yeah. So I, there's a couple of other um, arguments that I want to look at. Okay. What's a common belief? Okay. So my follow-up question would be, how do, so we have to trust what John the Baptist says, am I correct? Because he's the one making the way for the Lord. And Bradley says, when I said the way, when Jesus said he's the way, that's out of context. It's not referring to the person who is the way. He said that, correct? So let's see what, am I correct here, Brother Nadim? He said that's... Okay, so... Correct. So Brother Nadim, and I want everyone in the chat to remember, we must accept what John the Baptist says. So does John the Baptist say the meaning of that verse in Isaiah? Yes, he does. In the Gospel of John, chapter one, under the he fig tree. Now, John here's chapter the thing: one, verse when we believe in Jesus, said, not sure. Yeah, yeah is yeah, that? Yeah, I think. Um, hold on. Um, I think um, you got. Um, the discussion goes a little bit further. You can go up to eleven fifteen. Uh, it it goes on a little bit more after that. We believe I in Jesus with all our mind. It's playing two different audio sets for some reason. Oh no, no, that's not that's uh, not you. Bradley okay. is trying to talk over e jazz. Okay. The wilderness. This is John the Baptist speaking. Make straight the way of the Lord. Bradley says the Lord here means Yahweh. Let's hear what John the Baptist, the prophet, the one who is the authority on this statement, what that authority says. He says, just as Isaiah the prophet said, and they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? What does John the Baptist answer in verse 26 and verse 27? 
John answered them, saying, I baptize you with water in your midst. Stands one who you do not know. I am not worthy un to untie the strap of his sandal. These things took place in Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Then he tells us who Jesus is in verse 29. On the next day, he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Look, the Lamb of the Lord, the one who takes away the sin of the world. That one is the one about whom I said, After me is coming a man who is ahead of me. He doesn't say ahead of me is coming God. He defines for us who the way of the Lord is. He says the man ahead of me. John chapter 1, verse 30, and I'll finish with this. He says, And I did not know him, but in order that he could be revealed to Israel, because of this, I came baptizing with water. He defines him not as Yahweh, not as the Lord, not as God, but a man, just like I said. All right. Yep. So um, actually... Um... Bradley did get a little bit riled up at a couple of points in that exchange, which was rather unfortunate, you know. Um, I think at, at certain points he started saying things that he shouldn't have, and, you know, that became reason for the um, Muslim side to uh, take offense and to talk about how rude and uncharitable Bradley is. Now, I don't know Bradley all that well. I don't know if he is a consistently unpleasant fellow or maybe he just lost his temper this one time uh, so i'm not going to judge his um character but i just think that it's unfortunate that he lost his temper um during this exchange that's all i'm going to say about that um particular incident now discussion uh, goes into J the gospel of john um what does john the baptist think about jesus Right, so they just read through verses 22 through 35. Um, there are some verses that they focused on specifically. One is uh, verse 23, where John the Baptist says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Um, now, the argument is that the way of the Lord is actually referring to Jesus. And apparently, if you cross-reference that uh, with John chapter 6, Jesus calls himself the way. So maybe the way is uh, of the Lord is referring to Jesus here. Um, which is a little bit counterintuitive because the way you would normally think um, this verse is being understood is that, the, that Jesus is the Lord whose way is being prepared. Uh, actually, you know, I'm going to argue that that uh, the uh, understanding that Jesus is the way of the Lord here, while clever, doesn't quite work. Um, first of all, what is um, John the Baptist doing with the way of the Lord? Make straight the way of the Lord. You can't make Jesus straight. Okay, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense there. Uh, also... Um, the word Lord is used of Jesus many times throughout the Gospel of John. This is a consistent Johannine theme. Um, all you have to do is look up, a, look up all the instances of, word, of the word Lord, uh, and you'll see that it's used of Jesus all the time. John chapter 6, verse 23. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. John chapter 6, verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. John chapter 8, 11, she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. And from now on, sin no more. And then John chapter 9, verse 38, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. So you can see it's a fairly consistent joining theme to refer to Jesus as Lord. Okay, so there's nothing remiss about positing that when John is John the Baptist is quoting from Isaiah in chapter uh, in chapter one verse twenty three that the way of the Lord here the Lord is referring to Jesus. This is a very important quote of Isaiah, by the way, because if you look at the original Hebrew, uh, which uh, let me pull it up now. Um, 
A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the desert highway for God. Guess what the word Lord is in the Hebrew? The tetragrammaton. Make straight the way of Adonai or Yahweh. So th it would be very important for a Muslim to deny that the Lord here in question is Jesus because if John the Baptist is applying a verse from Isaiah about a Yahweh uh, to Jesus, you know, then it's game, set, match. Now, Ejaz would go on to argue that John does not believe that Jesus is God. Um, like putting verse 23 to the side for a moment, uh, I think it's important to note that in verse 30, um, John the Baptist says, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. So um, at the very least, even if you don't believe John the Baptist thinks of Jesus as God, you have to at the very least admit that John the Baptist think Jesus had some sort of earthly, earthly pre-existence, right? Now, even if you're a Muslim, that's already going too far because they don't believe Jesus has an earthly pre-existence. Now, later on, actually, Ijaz makes an interesting argument. He says that John the Baptist does not refer to Jesus as God, but refers to him as the chosen one of God. And for that, he refers to uh, verse 33. Uh, there's a textual variant here. Uh, you can see that um, the NA28 has eos tu theu, but there's an, other, there's an alternate reading uh, that says eklektos tu theu. Um, now that's a minority reading. Uh, the uh, NA28 authors have not chosen it as the main reading for this verse, uh, be that as it may. Even if we grant that Eklektos to Theu is the correct reading here, it doesn't follow that if John sees Jesus as the chosen one of God, that he does not consider him to be divine, right? That is a non sequitur. Um, you would have to find like a positive denial of uh, Jesus being divine, which, you know, not is not found anywhere in this text. And, you know, at the very least, verse 30 and verse 23 would seem to point in the other direction. Um, one other thing I want to make note of is that um, this verse is mentioned, is quoted in the other Gospels. For example, in Mark chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Um you can see here that it is being quoted and it's being attached to um, Malachi chapter 3, uh, verse 1. And why this is important is that, um, well, the, they're both about Yahweh, actually, because if you look at Malachi, the verse from Malachi, it goes on to say that then you will see the Lord coming into his temple. Well, how is uh, how is the story of the gospel supposed to mirror that. Well, who comes into the temple towards the end of the gospel? It's Jesus. Uh, Simon Gatherup Cole actually has an important book called The Preexistent Son, Recovering the Christologies of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, it's a very important book to have if you want to look at evidence for divinity of Jesus in the synoptic gospels. He points out that uh, the at the very least, um, you have to admit that according to the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus had a pre-earthly existence. And in page 244, Simon Gathercoll comments on the verse we just read. Thus, it is probable that Mark understands Jesus' statement as a self-reference to himself as Lord, although the reference may simply be to Jesus doing the work of the Lord God. The designation Jesus as Lord in Mark chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 points quite clearly to an identification between him and Yahweh. In Mark chapter 1, verse 2, God makes the promise to his son, to send John, to prepare the, your way, which is then rephrased in the next verse as to prepare the way of the Lord. This is obviously of particular importance for Christology since the original reference in Isaiah 43 is uh, to preparing the way of Yahweh. This is to be distinguished from the reference by David to Jesus as my Lord in Mark 12, 35, 37, where Jesus cites Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord. Here, Jesus is the second Lord in the phrase, and the reference is merely to the fact that Jesus is David's Lord rather than his being Yahweh. So, in other words, uh, according to Gather Cole, um, as you can see here, Mark chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 is a clear identification 
of Jesus as Yahweh. Um, and, you know, this is, and this is also in the context of John baptizing. So if you put uh, the Gospel of John's account and the Gospel of Mark's account together, um, you get a pretty solid argument for the divinity of Jesus there. All right, let's uh, go on to the next one here. It's going to be at 1115 to 1220, a discussion of John 2028. Let me share it. Okay. So now, just so you remember and you don't forget, you didn't answer why the four authors of the four Gospels independently agreed that Jesus does not receive La Trua in their writings, but others exclusively received uh, reserved for God the Father. You didn't answer that Jesus didn't demand La Trua, but he demanded, I think it was Timaeo, the word for honor. He demanded honor, Timaeo, one of the two, I can't remember. He demanded honor, which it's is the same as, 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 no, he demanded honor, uh, not uh, Prosculeo, I think. Um, oh, honor. honor. He demand, yeah, he demanded honor, not worship, as God the Father is. And thirdly, we know that the glory that he demands before the world began in John 17, 5, is the same as the glory of the angels in Mark 8, 38b in the earliest gospel for that verse. And I'll leave the audience with this. Any Christian who appeals to John 20, 28 for Dalton Thomas saying, my Lord and my God, there is not a single manuscript before the late second century maybe early uh, third century that has that passage in it complete. The first complete edition comes in the fourth century CE for the words, uh, the God of me. So it's about three centuries older than Christ himself. I'll leave you with that. All right, so there's a lot. All right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, anyone who is arguing for the divinity of Jesus from the gospels, um, you know, if you want to find a um, verse in the Bible that clearly refers to Jesus as God, the God, with the definite article, John 20, 28 would be it. Um, you may be aware um, uh, that among Jehovah's Witnesses, they try to diffuse references to Jesus as God by saying, oh, um, you know, it's just small G God, you know, not big G God. And you know that because um, there's no definite article uh, when Jesus is called small G God, you know, which is, you know, a fairly simplistic understanding of Greek grammar. In fact, if you ever read uh, Greek grammar beyond the basics, um, uh, Dr. Wallace has a whole section there on Caldwell's rule explaining why um, the fact that uh, something has uh, lacks a definite article does not necessarily mean it's indefinite. That being said, that doesn't apply to John 20, 28, because as you can see in the Greek, the definite article is attached to the word theos. So, G John, so Thomas is referring to Jesus as capital G God. So how does Ejaz uh, deal with this? He points to the fact that um, our earliest manuscript um, Complete manuscript of John containing this doesn't occur until the fourth century. And I don't think this was clearly brought out in the section that we just played, but he has argued in the past that um, the earliest manuscript that we have of John 20, 28 is, has a lacuna in it. And, um, you know, this is one of those big um, um, unfortunate um, things that happens in New Testament textual criticism that it just so happens that there's a hole in P66 precisely where the word Otheos uh, would occur. Um, and Ejaz likes to ex exploit this, saying, well, there's a hole in it, so who knows what P66 could have read there. Um, I should point out a few things in response to this. One, um, there's a reason why most of our manuscripts from the second century didn't survive because most of those manuscripts were in papyrus, right? Anyone who knows anything about textual criticism knows papyrus is a fragile material. It degrades easily. It does not uh, wear um, 
you know in order for it to survive the passage of time it has to be buried in a very dry environment now most of our biblical manuscripts are in parchment rather than papyrus and that's because parchment uh, made from animal hides is much more durable even if it's stored in less than ideal con uh, conditions it will still weather um, the you know weather the elements pretty well and it will still be readable um, which is you know that being said it, for all of the manuscripts that we do have of the gospel of john john 20 28 is actually fairly uh consistent if you look at the apparatus entry um for john 20 28 as found in the na 28 uh there are no significant variants that would impact our understanding of the verse um now what about p66 uh i should note here that uh, bradley actually has already responded to this saying that just because there's lacuna doesn't mean that we can't know um he points out and actually he's probably taking this from james white because james white responded to this same argument in a video many many years ago that the size of the lacuna in p66 is precisely the right uh um size for you to place the missing words all fail smooth um and in fact you know uh if you find the original white video it was all the way back i think 2016 or 2017 he reconstructs uh the text of the lacuna showing that it fits perfectly okay well let's say you don't believe white you don't believe bradley um perhaps i should bring in another uh, authority to the table and that is philip comfort because philip comfort in his um collation of p66 actually fills in the lacunae uh and if you look at here um in the screen this is how um comfort uh, does it uh the yellow text is the extant uh part this is the part that's been preserved the gray uh which is in brackets uh is the part that has been worn out by the uh you know by the elements and you can see uh, that comfort reconstructs the passage and according to comfort uh the reconstruction will yield the same reading as all the other manuscripts uh, notice that um, the words kyrios and theos are shortened to uh kappa sigma and uh, theta sigma respectively that's uh what you call the nomina sacra in um new testament textual criticism you take divine names and you shorten them to just the first uh, and last letters. Uh, if you take that into consideration, then, you know, um, the uh, reconstruction makes perfect sense. So, you know, uh, Ejaz likes to appeal to uh, comfort uh, and his sexual criticism. Well, comfort here agrees uh, that P66 originally read K Okirios Muke Ofelsmu. So I could then appeal to him and say, well, there you go. Um, it's game, set, match for John 2028. Uh, all the manuscripts uh, read the same way. And even the one with the lacuna can reasonably be reconstructed to achieve the same reading. And once you look at what the reading says, it's a clear reference to the deity of Christ. So there you go. Um, those are all the major arguments that Ejaz uh, has used in this short exchange. It's amazing how much commentary we can uh, attach to six and a half minutes of arguments. Hmm. Yeah, I appreciate you doing that, and um, you know, hopefully, if there's uh, if there's more content to rebut, uh, I'd love to see more of that because I think this was a really good engagement, especially in light of uh, in light of the text of the New Testament with the verbum software tools that you were using there. <laughs> yeah, you know what, verbum is such a lifesaver when doing mm. this kind of research because it makes it so easy to look up all the relevant instances of a word. Like, it would have taken me weeks to uh, do this preparation if I was just using regular paper lexicons and a paper Greek New Testament. Mm -hmm. But if I was using verbum, 
you know it only takes me four or five days to achieve the same results uh the miracles of modern technology i'm telling you and shameless plug here if you want to get a discount on verbum software go to reason well actually it's verbum.com forward slash reason you'll get a discount on any of the packages that you choose along with five free books and it supports me here at reason and theology so yeah. once again and you know you can look at all of the resources that i cited um in fact i think one of the things that i'll do after this i'll try to uh create a list of all the resources that I consulted uh, while preparing this so that anyone who's interested can go and grab those resources themselves as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. OK. Yeah. <laughs> and can I uh, respond to one thing in the comment section? Mm -hmm. um, yep. so M. Grace says, and I quote, Ijaz Ahmed should be ignored. He has some medical issues that contribute to his bad behavior, so we need to keep that in mind. But I just don't think it is worth it to address him. Um, respectfully, I disagree. Um, I'm going to admit, Ijaz does act up sometimes, okay? Um, we've had our scrapes on occasion. And there's um, that one incident that happened a couple years ago. If you know what it, you're, I'm talking about, um, you know. If not, you know. Don't worry about it too much. What I want to point out is that actually uh, I have spoken with Ejaz quite a bit and he knows, he, he recognizes that he's misbehaved in the past and he has been trying to um, improve his behavior. Okay, obviously he doesn't do it perfectly, but he is trying to uh, be respectful even if he doesn't always succeed. And I think, you know, Maybe I'm being naive. You can blame me if um, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. But if I think that somebody is trying to be better, I think the fact that they're trying should be given recognition and should be respected. And personally, if EJS wanted to come on this channel and have a dialogue, I would not be opposed to that. Yeah, well, let, let's see what develops. I'd love to hear some feedback on this show. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. But hey, do we have time to take uh, comments? Yeah, uh, just a few minutes here. I have to head out in just a moment. Go ahead and grab one, the, the one okay. that's most uh, fitting. Declan think. Sutherland says, what position Ahmed would have on the Bible itself? If he falls, the majority takes a truck. Would it not say Jesus is God? Why would it matter if it did? So, um, you know. This is a common thing that you'll see Muslims do. Uh, they will uh, argue that the Bible is corrupted, uh, but they'll say that even considering the Bible as we have it, you still would not arrive at Christian theology um, through the extant text. So they try to get both bases covered, the biblical reliability base as well as the uh, biblical theology base. Actually, I did debate Ejaz twice on this very topic. The first is, can we trust the New Testament? And the second is, um, does the Islamic tradition teach biblical corruption? Uh, I'll try to um, provide links to both of those as well. Yeah. Well, once again, thanks so much, Louis, for coming on and doing this. Put in a plug for anything that you want to make the viewers aware of. Uh, well, um, I am actually trying to get more Muslim apologists and scholars on reason and theology. I've been talking to a member of the Ahmadi community. Um, so God willing, we'll have one um, next month. And also I'm trying to get a 12-er Shi'i representative on here as well. So we're going to get all the different uh, major schools within Islam represented so everyone can better understand that Islam is not a monolith. There are different viewpoints out there. And also, uh, I've been doing research on Quranic, like Muslim arguments for the divine origin of the Quran. Uh, like, what are the arguments that they present in favor of the view that, you know, this is the word of God? So I'm preparing a presentation on that, two presentations actually. Lord willing, we'll have a, um, a good discussion of um, some of those arguments and how to rebut them. Yeah, it looks like Patrick has enjoyed this. He says, Louis, you do great work. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. <clears throat> Once again, thank you so much for doing this, Louis. I look forward to more. Everybody hit that like button, subscribe button, and also check me out at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me.